Welcome to Education Matters. Judge David Lee's consent order of January 21st, 2020 directed the defendants representing the state to submit a status report setting out the specific actions that the state defendants must implement in 2020 to begin to address the issues identified by West Ed. Since then, in the midst of COVID-19, the state and the plaintiffs have worked to develop the joint report issued on June 15th with the required specific actions and investments. Today on the show, we discuss the specific Leandro Action Plan and our students' constitutional right to a sound basic education. I'd like to welcome to the show James Ford, member of the North Carolina State Board of Education and Executive Director of the Center for Racial Equity in Education, CREED. Thank you so much, Mr. Ford, for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And last week, as you know, parties in the long running um, school funding case known as Leandro, which includes uh, the State Board of Education, submitted their uh, short term action plan for 2021 to Judge David Lee that details the actions and investments that North Carolina must take to ensure each of our children in North Carolina receive an equitable opportunity to a sound basic education. So my question for you as a member of the State Board of Education and someone who last year launched an organization devoted to racial equity in education, can you give us some insight into the development of the plan? Yeah, so one thing I do wanna say is this is sort of a preliminary report. Uh, it is not yet an exhaustive plan. Um, it does provide a framework that at least, at least gives uh, the courts an idea of how we plan on approaching things. The actual plan won't be due until the fall. Um, but you know, the intersections of opportunity, of economics and race are overlapping at almost every turn. And so, whereas I think the initial Leandro case kind of dealt with, you know, historically marginalized groups uh, who were disenfranchised economically, uh, when you look at the counties, you know, that are represented, when you look at the student populations, you're going to notice there's a particular uh, complexion of those students as well, not exclusively. But um, so for me, the overall conversation is about equity, um, even if it wasn't termed that way uh, in the mid 90s when the case was initially in introduced. Um, so my work, as you know, um, keys in on racial equity, uh, but equity writ large, and because of those intersections of both, of both, uh, you know, low income students, low income counties, and uh, insufficiently funded districts, uh, we know what the majority of those districts and those schools look like, the black and brown kids, indigenous kids, and so for us, it's a moral and ethical obligation to do right by those student groups who have typically been left behind and are too often uh, also students of color. Talk about how students of color in North Carolina are disproportionately impacted by our failure to meet our constitutional obligation all of these years, ensuring them the right to a sound basic education. And from your perspective, um, state board member and your professional mm -hmm. hat, what pieces of the plan in particular may begin to remedy the harm that's been caused um, in your opinion? Yeah, so first and foremost, um, you know, folks of color comprise a large majority of those who, you know, uh, are low income. Uh, who aren't making li a livable wage, um, a sizable percentage of those who live in the rural parts uh, of the state, which, you know, that's the, the origin, if you will, of the case before it evolved into some of the urban pockets who ended up joining on to the case. And so um, how that breaks out, what that, what that looks like is that they also tend not to have access to the most effective teachers and the most effective principals. And then the, the funding of those schools, the way that those schools are resourced, uh, those are systemic issues that end up um, happening as a result of being under-resourced. And so um, in our approach for this plan, it's, it's to find ways to, to, to cure uh, who gets access to really good teaching, right, and, and making sure that that does not break along social and economic lines, uh, building in pipelines for principals, because we know that having strong leaders is a huge part of that as well, but also accountability for those things, measuring our progress uh, toward goals, because listen, we don't want to be revisiting uh, this the next 20 years down the line and continue to, to talk about how we're not offering a sound basic education. And so for me, particularly around the monitoring aspect, um, uh, uh, and quality control. Those are those are huge parts. And you know, uh, Creed, uh, my organization, we put out a report last year that exclusively looked at a lot of the same metrics, but you know, really focused and keyed in on race. And predictably, a lot of the outcomes are the same for those uh, groups of color. And so, both hats, both my professional hat and my uh, hat as a member of the state board, compel me and compel us to take really progressive approaches for how to make sure that you know scores and generations of kids 
don't end up in the same position and that they really are given access to educational opportunity. Right. Um, much of the action plan is focused on revising uh, a school finance system that has over time evolved to really exacerbate the inequities in our school communities. And it also makes uh, much needed critical investments in teacher and uh, principal preparation pipelines um, and existing teacher and principal pipelines, as you mentioned. Um, you're a former North Carolina Teacher of the Year, been all over the state. Uh, talk about those two specific areas and why they're the most critical in moving us closer to Leandro. So it's a fundamentally inequitable system uh, that despite sort of the best efforts at some of the state and even some of the local supplements, that it ultimately too often leaves behind the same uh, historically marginalized student groups. And so that needs to be overhauled, that needs to be re revised. We need to take a uh, another look at that and, and, and reimagine another system that really does do right by those who have the greatest needs. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, uh, Leandro is always focused in on teachers and leaders, right? Um, and I, I was excited to see that in the West End report that they also focused on focused in on the need not just to have um, you know competent teachers and leaders, but also leaders of color as well. Well, how do you do that unless you figure out how to build pipelines and create deliberate strategies around developing these things? And so we feel like that's a sound place to invest our energies and our, and our finances is, in, is, is shoring up a pipeline that, that does that for perpetuity. Um, that requires energy and, and focus because whatever doesn't get you know, looked at and scrutinized ultimately is probably gonna fall by the wayside. So we feel like this is an opportunity to finally build that into our approach as a state. As I look through the action plan, I noticed that the third largest request for funding in 2021 uh, was a $38 million first step, first investment, if you will, in targeting a non-K-12 budget item, early childhood education. Share with us why the state board has made this such a high priority in addressing Leandro as it came out of the consent order from the judge. So, and that kind of, you know, folds into the, you know, the previous comment I made, which is, you know, so that doesn't technically sit under the state board, the auspices of the State Board of Education. And yet we know that it's a crucial sort of, uh, you know, cornerstone of everything that we're talking about. You know, the access to quality early childhood education, something that at this point has not been made available to, certainly not everyone, but some of our uh, most deserving and most, um, uh, you know, uh, populations that stand in the greatest need. And so in North Carolina, we do it well, I mean, overwhelmingly, um, but it, it's, it, it dovetails into the, the child's and sets up a child's ability to read, right, effectively uh, by, by grades three, right? It also has all sorts of other mobility implications in terms of uh, how the student is, is able to socially mobilize himself throughout the rest of their life. And so for us, although it doesn't fall uh, directly into the target of, of K-12, it has so much bearing on everything else. We can't afford not to uh, focus our energies on making sure that early care and education is foundational to whatever our approaches are because at the end of the day it's about attacking root causes and so that's i think it's worthy of the funding and the attention uh, that we've allocated or have directed uh, at this juncture but that's really what it is is an acknowledgement that we can't do it without making sure that um you know the first institution of learning and growing outside of the family is properly shored up and resourced james ford it's been our distinct pleasure to have an opportunity to hear your thoughts and your actions and all you and your state board members are doing and you're doing in our communities across North Carolina. Thank you for joining us. I know we'll be seeing and hearing from you soon. Take good care and thank you for being with us again today. Once again, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. After the break, we'll hear from a former Sampson County student as well as the superintendent of the Cumberland County Schools. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Joining us now are Daisy Almonte, a graduate of the Sampson County Public Schools and Dr. Marvin Conley Jr., Superintendent of the Cumberland County Schools. And thank you both for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Ms. Almonte, if you would um, talk about your perspective and experiences as a former student with the Sampson County Schools in Eastern North Carolina 
Um, as you know, today we're talking about the importance of ensuring that every child in North Carolina has adequate and equitable access to a sound basic education. So one point that I've been trying to drive home um, right now in the midst of all this is that the main thing here is that this court case started way before I was even a student in Samson County Schools, a rural, a rural student in North Carolina. And when I reflect on my experiences, a lot of the things that I experienced in my rural county um, system, exposure, no exposure to emerging fields, lack of adequate resources for our teachers, no culturally relevant teachers. Um, all of these things are experiences that I share with people who were in school long before I was even born, um, including experiences shared with Robert Leandro himself. Um, one of the, I think, most impactful moments of reflection was a couple of weeks ago when I had a conversation with him and we realized just how many things were similar for both me and him. Um, for example, the way that it was so difficult to get access to advanced placement courses. For me, for instance, um, I took two years of AP English only because my English teacher made an arrangement to teach two classes at the same time. We ended up being taught mostly in the hallway and then AP government I took online because my parents sacrificed other necessities to be able to afford internet in our rural home. So the most striking thing is not necessarily what I've experienced, but the fact that the experiences remain the same across many decades in the state. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Dr. Conley, uh, thanks again to you for making time out of your schedule to be here today. Um, the short-term action plan offered by the parties in the Leandro case um, provides a substantial uh, first step towards remedying our decade-long failure to meet our constitutional obligation to ensure every child in North Carolina has access to a sound basic education. What pieces of the plan strike you as the most important first steps for fiscal year 2021? Thank you, Tom, and thank you for having me. Um, I think the most important first step uh, for fiscal year 21 is the plan's recognition um, that regardless of the short-term revenue loss due to COVID-19 pandemic, the state's current investment in K-12 public ed must be maintained overall and increased significantly in the area of uh, teacher salary, recruitment, retention, the state simply has not been meeting its constitutional uh, mandate and obligation to provide the opportunity for sound major education uh, for all children for a decade prior to the pandemic and the state and its children cannot fall further behind. Um, since the 2008-2009 um, recession, um, the history shows that the per pupil spending has actually fallen by 6% when you adjust for inflation, um, making us the the sixth lowest in the area, in the region, in our southeastern state. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Um, Ms. Almonte, I'd like to come back to you. And as a student whose first language is not English, uh, you were likely glad to see uh, in the Leandro Action Plan from the state more support for English language learners so that students like yourself and others can have more equitable access to the tools needed to succeed in the classroom. Tell us a little bit about the barriers to educational success you faced as an English language learner and what advice you would give to our current students as they strive to reach their goals. Absolutely, so I think it's documented in the West Ed report, the independent investigation on the needs of North Carolina schools that the number of students who are English learners has more than doubled over the past 15 years in the state. And for me, what that meant was being confused about what exactly the directions on an assignment were asking me to do, being puzzled by allusions to pop culture references that I did not know in the classroom, struggling to share the knowledge that I had 
with my classmates and my teachers. And I think that's the most important point that it's extremely frustrating to have thoughts and contributions that you can't share, not because you don't know the material, but because you're just not able to communicate. And my advice for both students and educators alike would be that, yes, we do need more funding and that's an important next step, but it's also important to reframe the way that we think about being an English language learner. It's not a deficit. Um, being an English language learner means that you are acquiring a second language, which is an incredible asset. And I think that's something that I did for myself. Um, I was able to say, well, I'm struggling because of this, but this in itself is a valuable thing that I'm learning. I'm working on honing a very valuable uh, thing for myself. Um, so I guess my biggest advice would be not to be ashamed of this identity, but to be proud of it. And that it is the responsibility of our schools to help to help us develop this bilingual capacity. Very good. Thank you for sharing those insights. Um, Dr. Conley, uh, not only does this plan work towards leveling the, leveling the playing field with regards to our school finance systems, it also does more to ensure that we have more mental health support for our school communities that uh, the students need. It's more critical than ever before with COVID-19 as well as the effects of the racial um, injustices that we've seen, um, especially in recent weeks and months. $40 million of additional dollars are in the Leandro Action Plan for school instructional support personnel. Uh, talk a little bit of how you think that will benefit uh, your students there in Cumberland across North Carolina, as well as teachers and parents as we try to assure every child receives a sound basic education. Uh, the 40 million will uh, significantly impact uh, our support for students, especially in high poverty areas and racially isolated uh, areas of the state. North Carolina has, uh, for too long, provided far fewer um, psychologists, nurses, uh, social workers, counselors, than what is needed. And we have to match fill those positions. So the 40 million will help us along the way. And certainly uh, the impact of COVID-19 has had a um, significant impact on our children. Um, and so we have to think about what support will be needed in addition to the normal circumstances, uh, what would be needed to help our children uh, recover from the impact of COVID-19. So this 40 million will help us match them uh, the shortage that we've had for so long in social, emotional learning and support. We've got about 30 seconds left and I'd like you to share with our viewers what do you think the sense of support within the community is for the Leandro Action Plan? I think the community is behind us 100% uh, to ensure this plan is implemented because investment in education uh, is the only way out of poverty uh, and adverse circumstances for many children. So uh, investment in education is investment in North Carolina's future. Thank you so much. Ms. Almonte, as you uh, have graduated from your undergraduate program and go to law school in the fall, best wishes to you, Dr. Conley. Best wishes to you for much continued success in Cumberland. Thank you both so very much. Nice to have you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. North Carolina and its elected and appointed leaders are at a pivotal time in our history as we're forced to confront the unprecedented health and economic realities of COVID-19 and the impact on the well-being of our citizens and our essential public institutions. Without a doubt, while the funding and policy decisions our leaders face are daunting, our elected state leaders have a golden opportunity for their long-term visionary and bold leadership 
to invest in a better North Carolina for all. This leadership opportunity offers a defining moment in their legacy to chart a course leading North Carolina to a new level of excellence in the coming years. The major disruption to North Carolina by COVID-19 has brought to light the many inequities faced by our most vulnerable citizens and communities, especially based on racial inequalities, income and geography, from food insecurity and housing to healthcare, broadband access and educational opportunities. Likewise, our nation and state is experiencing firsthand the impact of embedded systemic racial and social injustices, as evidenced by the recent killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Rayshard Brooks. For our K-12 students, a major step to increase systemic educational opportunities was taken on June 15th when the state's Leandro Action Plan was submitted to Judge David Lee, identifying its short 2021 priorities and additional funding of $427 million. This plan and needed budget are a first step in meeting our state's constitutional requirement for this and future generations of children. The short-term state plan is strategically aligned to Judge Lee's consent order issued on January 21st, 2020, which requires an eight-year state plan to become Leandro compliant, ensuring every child their constitutional opportunity for a sound basic education. Two of the major systems the Leandro Action Plan is required to address are the financial system, how state funds are allocated to schools to meet student needs, and the accountability system, how the state, schools, and students are assessed and reported on making academic progress. These systems have been the subject of much discussion over the past few decades, and with the required Leandro Action Plan, they need to be moved front and center to substantial action by our state leaders. In addition, two essential school-based factors are at the core of each child, regardless of zip code, receiving a sound basic education. These are the availability, quality, and investments in both our teachers and principals, the two leading research-based factors in student achievement and school success. The action plan recognizes a key aspect of supporting our educators and students is the need to invest in whole child support by increased resources for school counselors, nurses, social workers, and psychologists, which are currently below the national average. Today, perhaps more than ever before, the need for these professionals is paramount. Finally, North Carolina is rightfully proud of its long-stranding national reputation as a leader in quality early childhood education. The Action Plan acknowledges that our state has failed to adequately invest in equalizing the opportunity for more pre-K students in what the research has proven is a wise investment in our state's future students, employees, and citizens. Yes, these are challenging times for our state leaders, but this is North Carolina, and challenges don't cause us to be timid or fearful. They inspire us to work together for the betterment of the state's children and all citizens. Yes, the Leandro Action Plan is a constitutional requirement, but it's also an ethical and moral imperative for our state leaders to take the next big step in meeting the needs of our students this year and for years to come. That's it for Education Matters. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.